Hey, my name is Tony Porter. I'm the uh, audio engineer for Power Rangers Battle for the Grid. You've been listening to the Rated R podcast here at Babsters. Thank you so much for listening to this. Hello, and welcome back to another Bamsters Rated R podcast. Uh, back with us today again, I have my buddy G. Oh, I'm supposed to say something. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. How are you doing? Hey. <laughs> and joining us today, we have a, an old friend of the show, uh, a buddy who came by. Uh, man, it was first season, first uh, 30-some episodes. I forget exactly which one, but uh, Tony Porter. Hey. Uh, audio designer extraordinaire. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you guys so much. I'm glad to see that you guys are still uh, casting the pods as such as it is. <laughs> oh, is that well, still, thank you for joining us in, in, in our podcast? new video format. Uh, yeah, with a video format. Do they still call them podcasts? Well, they try to call I mean, them this will main one point. Like, right, because this video. will never even see an iPod, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, well, we do we do still have the audio only version that we put out um, okay. uh, on the website, and then we put out video versions on Facebook and YouTube. So, okay, okay, iTunes, cool, cool, cool. Spotify, Player FM, yeah, right. everywhere, all the places. That's great. I mean, now is the time to have a podcast, right? It seems that as soon as everyone got shut in doors, everyone's like next idea was like, I'm going to start a podcast, and so now there's yeah. tons of them, and and that's. <laughs> That's fine. That's great. People got need something to do, I guess, and it's a completely valid way of trying to connect with people. Even if you're not interviewing, you're just jettisoning out your information out there. I mean, why not? You know, I, I think in some ways that's kind of the cool thing about uh, what podcasts are. Uh, I don't listen to a ton of different podcasts, but kind of the, the neat thing that I've seen out there is there's appears to be pretty much a podcast for every kind of interest. So if you're oh, into yeah. like murder mystery stories, for instance, which I understand are pretty big, um, mm -hmm. you know, or just people reading books, uh, you know, th there's all kinds of stuff, different, different uh, interests that are, that podcasts, you know, meet. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's hu huge market for it. And because there's no, like, there's no um, gatekeeper, you know, you could just put yeah. your stuff on, on YouTube or whatever. It all gets out there. There's, I mean, that does lead to problems of like, how do you curate this? How do you find all this stuff? Um, yeah. If you look around, you th start throwing rocks in different directions. They're just going to hit something. Well, there's so, a lot of um, um, small companies who are offering, you know, either to market all these small podcasts, or mm -hmm. even just every podcast platform. And there's a lot of them. Um, offer yeah. ways of being curated. Uh, it's not always, not always kosher. Um, yeah. But you're right about there being a lot of podcasts and the sh a lot of them have shown up. I think for many who are, you know, isolating, quarantining alone mm -hmm. or who are just not seeing their friends, these podcasts also offer a way of inviting somebody into your home, you know, into your head that you're listening to because a lot of them are just life. You know, yep. People talking about life. Right. So uh, we talk about some technical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's where people can draw authenticity from. It's so easy to just like extrapolate on something when you when you know it innately. It's something you feel comfortable talking about. I've never done any broadcasting or whatever in my life, but you're talking about something that I really care about, and it shows and it comes out. And that's that's a that's a cool thing about a, about a podcast. It, it totally yeah. gives people the voice that maybe they didn't know they had. I'm sure some of them are going to continue after this. Many are probably going to you know, go away. We'll still be here making yeah. terrible shows. I'm <laughs> <laughs> you can count on that. <laughs> but we ain't quitting. See, see, that's the thing too. I like the idea about. I've all. I've been thinking about it recently. I said I just. I just recently got OBS installed. I've been wanting to do some kind of streaming or broadcasting or something. But I don't really know if I want to do it with like any regularity. I don't know if I want to have a format or a show. Or if that is what's going to keep me moving forward. Oh, I got to put together another show. I can I can do something because some things like I just want to like pull up my guitar and just like riff around for like half, half an hour. But I don't know who's going to show up for that. But I do feel like putting it out there sometimes. And so I don't I don't know if I'd want to do like a format or something or 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 like an interview. But, but uh, the same thing at the same time, I like the platform. You know, yeah. I like being able to 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 reach out and shove shove something in someone's face and see who likes it you know 
shove it in. I think the cool thing about doing that for for someone in your position <laughs> yeah. is that it allows you. To, well, no, it allows you to create this library of of you know different. If you're riffing on a guitar, or you're making sounds or something like that. It allows you to create this like video library of things that you can use for future interviews or you know stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and then, well, that's the, that's the other thing. Um, when I'm writing something or I'm designing sounds, it's usually for a project I can't talk about. It's usually for something that hasn't been announced or whatever. And so that kind of um, that leaves it to like only doing stuff that I'm that I'm like writing for me. And I I swear to God, I haven't been able to write or do anything for me, like my own personal projects in a long time. It's just been for the project stuff that's coming out. Once it's come, it's out, then that's cool. But I really like the idea. Someone was just talking to me about this. Um, uh, promoting yourself by just do, creating it online, creating that natural brand, making that connection with an audience who not only is, wants to buy the finished product, oh, hey, I'm a character, buy the finished product, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, see how it's put together. And, and I mean, that fascinates me, at least, uh, uh, see how everything is kind of created. So, uh, you know, the, the processes, the artistic thoughts, the technical aspects of it, I really like that idea, and so I think that's why I'm kind of drawn to like thinking about like I would love to like write a song online, you know. But I really, I really just don't have the time. Everything that I'm writing right now is going into projects that I can't talk about yet at all. <laughs> Definitely not going to try to lure it out of you. Nope. Well, actually, right now, I mean, if uh, right now um, I'm working on something that just got. Well, it's still Power Rangers, but we're uh, we just made a big announcement of, of season three characters and stuff, so we could talk about you know the newest kind of stuff that's uh, that's in it. Um, I wouldn't know anything beyond that anyway, other than ideas. But there are, nothing's been confirmed other than what we just we just put this out uh, yesterday. Season three, three new characters bringing our roster up to eighteen, twenty-one fighters, I guess. Um, which is not not too bad. But we've been online for about a year and slowly kind of gaining traction. It's a, um, I swear, it, it mirrors a lot of what I went through um, creating Sword Coast, because it was the same kind of like budget and same kind of like it's an IP that everyone knows and loves, or that a certain you know dedicated following knows and loves. So it comes about with this like. Well, why didn't you do it like this? Well, what's, we're a small team. There's not a, a whole lot of money, but if you keep buying the game, we'll make more of it. And um, and uh, well, we all kind of know how how Sword Coast ended, but uh, uh, Power Rangers is for the for you know, it started off on kind of weird footing because it kind of came out, and um, people were expecting like the world from it, and it came out with like you know, modest graphics about nine characters uh a little buggy little glitchy but we were you know selling it pretty cheap so people's expectations kind of like uh, uh it had a weird first impression i guess when it first kind of came out i mean there's people who are you know excited about the franchise and and stuck with us and are still stuck uh sticking with us to this day um because they saw the vision they saw the idea they saw the potential for it and unlike sword coast here we've been blessed with having enough, uh, I don't know if it's the financial uh, amount that have been coming in, like we've been selling enough, or just someone's just betting on it, banking on it, saying, you know, let's put up more content, let's put up more content, and we can turn this thing around. And um, Power Rangers has turned itself around from being like the little game that, oh, what are those mobile graphics that's only got nine characters? You know, it's it's bright and colorful, it's nothing, there's no blood, it's, you know, Power Rangers, who watches that? Um to being something that's really um, respected, but still kind of low budget. We can only put out three characters, in, you know, at a time. Um, and so that, that it, again, coming from Sword Coast, it feels a lot like that, but it feels almost kind of like how Sword Coast, I, I wish it would have gone that way. You know, we, it was a small team and um, it was a cool idea some of the changes and things that we did to the project weren't met with uh, <laughs> with um, uh, how you say the the, the the warmest of arms. But I think there was a lot of people. I, I would I'd like to include you guys in that that saw the flaws, but saw the cool things that could be done with it if it were just 
added a little bit more if enough people were to get together and check this out with you know eyes unclouded by hate or whatever you know <laughs> they, they um they got that chance and so power rangers is getting that chance we're at third we're at our third season i hope we do a fourth you know i hope i can keep making these these characters for a while i can keep writing that music for a while um so it's 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 been it's been for me very affirming because after you leave a canceled project after you leave a project that sunk a studio that was there for 20 years making you know games that put their heart and soul in this last one and all that put it up put their money where their mouth is and then to have it fail um and to have it be you know lambasted by you know at least half the community we divided the community i think we did that pretty well um it feels again very very affirming to have something that's um getting that chance and uh I guess and, um, just for yeah. good measure, because not everybody will know what Short Coast Legends. Oh yeah, is. right, right. Um, disclaimer: myself, Drac, whichever corner he's in, and Tony, who's in <laughs> one of the other corners, um, mm -hmm. we know each other from a game called Short Coast Legends: Dungeons and Dragons um, game. Mm -hmm. It was even a licensed product. It was tied into everything mm -hmm. in what are they up to now? Fifth edition? Is that what they call it now? Uh, yeah, it was. Um and that was a point of contention, right? Um, because people didn't think it was proper fifth edition. And um, I'd say it wasn't all the way quite fifth edition. It was totally inspired by it, but they also looked at um, some fourth edition stuff. And ultimately they were trying to serve the game more so. And actually, I mean, from the direction from Wizards, they that was kind of their direction for it. They didn't want it to be a full fifth uh, edition game. If I recall them, I mean, they pushed back on some things that we wanted to put in that they, um, I'm not entirely sure why, because I think the, the, I think, I think the community wanted that. Um, well, at least the, the people who are fans of, of, of fifth edition in the direction that it took. Um, but it, it makes sense because fourth edition is, I, I'm going to say slightly more arcadey than, third and fifth yeah yep. yeah so uh, we and we're talking of video games so arcadey makes sense in that you're yeah as you said you're serving the game because it is a mm -hmm. computer game it is not a dungeon dragon simulation if you wanted that tabletop right. rpg just does, does it very well mm -hmm. I, I remember looking at the rules for fourth edition when they came out and thinking that they were trying to take a tabletop game and turn it into a video game while it was still a yep. tabletop game. That's very much how that felt. And fifth edition seemed to kind of circle uh, back somewhat uh, to it being more tabletop and less. Uh, uh, the two the two big things that I remember at least from that 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 kind of split community or fractured the community was there was the hardcore D and D crowd that really didn't like the fact that there was cooldowns on spells and abilities, yeah. which makes complete sense for a video game. So I didn't have an issue with that. And then the other thing was the the tool set and um, how much customization people really wanted out of that tool set. And, and looking at what we got, I think in part it felt like there was um, maybe uh, not as clear communication on how things were going to come out. But based on the improvements that we saw while you guys were still getting the opportunity to work on the game, I think had it been given enough time, uh, we would have gotten much closer to what people really wanted out of that tool set, or at least I hoped that we would have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a lot of people who um, really, uh, I don't know, m myself included, I love games, a any game that comes with some kind of an editor or a tool set or something that allows me to kind of manipulate the game, maybe in ways that it's not designed to do. Yeah. Um, and the thing about the tool set, even ha as it was, it had a lot of cool things that you can kind of, you know, it had interesting ways of solving things. You may have wanted it to do something and we didn't have that exact object in or that exact ability to hand that kind of quest in, but the kind of creativity that it, that I saw from some of the custom stuff that was coming out, um, was, uh, I don't know that it was very interesting to me because they were they were tackling it from a different direction to get the thing that they wanted out there, 
And not that not that I uh, think that it should have been a completely shackled experience, but sometimes when you're met with a boundary or a limitation, that's when you suddenly see the field for what it is and realize, okay, in order for me to do this, I need to do this first and then do this. I need to paint this sign, a, this special color, add a quest marker to it, and all of a sudden it will it will spit out you know you know random quests or something like that and. And I liked doing that. I actually created um, with the tool set. This this never unfortunately got out, but I showed everyone in the team um, a way of making a uh, tower defense game using the the uh, the tool set. And uh, <laughs> I still have it uh, as a uh, saved game uh, as a template in there, but it would never it wouldn't transfer over to the uh, to the retail project. So I had it just on my on my own. Um, I guess in whatever version we're working on there, a way to basically create this pathway that uh, you would then press a button and then it would start spawning all these characters that would just path, just using the regular pathing of of uh, the game and creating all these little kind of things, this little maze, and they would slowly walk through it. So if you created one guy, he'd slowly walk through it. If you created five guys, he'd walk through it. You create 20 guys and it looks like an army is slowly walking around there. And I create these areas <laughs> where you can put like an archer or, you know, uh, the goblin bomber or whatever. You can basically create your own tower defense scenarios, totally like a like a mini game kind of thing. And everyone walked in and they said, is this our game? Are you doing this with our game? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I had to cheat a few little, I did, did, a, did a, you know, a few little uh, editor only kind of tweaks and stuff in there. But the point was I was trying to show them that like, look, there's a lot of flexibility and they knew that. I mean, they're, they're smart guys. Anytime you go to, to an engineer and you say, Hey, check this out. Like, yeah, I know we don't do this because this and it's like, all right, thanks. <laughs> but um, when I showed them the, the, the tower defense thing, everyone was like, this is a really cool idea. I'm going to see if we can push to maybe make this like a little hidden mode or something in there because it's just one other, th one out of a thousand different things that you can do with the right, tool set and i don't think the tool set was quite there but i believe that that was the intention was to make it be flexible so people could do almost a one-to-one -one recreation for you know certain kinds of things uh, for certain kinds of uh, uh campaigns i see and then to create quickly quick you know arcade you know yeah. campaigns as well too and i think that's actually the the biggest problem with the big with the game was that it, we're trying to focus on D and D players, and you know the newbies trying to funnel them all in with a rule set that both of them would care about, and gameplay that both that would entice both of them. And I think in trying to get too many people at once, I think probably pissed off too much of the people that we really needed on our sides that like wouldn't even give us a time of day, and that was that was a damn shame. I think you know the people who just yeah. wrote it off yeah because had that tool set been given enough time and and managed to evolve um you know closer to to like what was being communicated that they wanted to do i think that game would have had a lot of longevity i mean you it, the the ease of use was something that was really great and i think it just needed a lot more time to to add a lot more stuff to it because i mean i still see people that are putting stuff out for neverwinter nights um, yeah. which had a much more complicated tool set, and there's a lot more you can do with that. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I mean, that game is, what, that's, is that almost 20 years old now? Except this version. It's, yeah, it's certainly. Old. Well, yeah, they remastered it, but it's yeah. still the old game. But no, that's... I still have my cloth map. <laughs> I, actually, I have... <laughs> right above my monitor, I have that map, and I have the Belfast statue up on a uh, on a shelf with some red red LEDs beneath it. <laughs> I uh, I still haven't assembled my Belfast statue. It's still sitting in a box oh. uh, because uh, I well I guess in the studio uh, I I didn't want to assemble it there, but I did want to put it in my home studio but then i've got kids and i all i heard was horrible stories about the wings the wings were the yeah. huge heavy wings that kept on falling off and if you get the right kind of glue or whatever I'm like oh man and now the box is probably getting too dinged up i should probably just put it together before it gets ruined in the box <laughs> oh. <laughs> i uh i 
I glued mine together when I put it in there, but um, just so that you can <laughs> kind of see. Oh, nice. Um, and then I I didn't like that the that the base was kind of plain. Um, it was just this plain black base. So I took and I textured the base with some mm. sand and painted that gray. And then I added oh, nice. uh, some blue um, like crystals and some little other types of ferns and stuff to make it look like the, I think it was like the lost, was it the lost cavern, lost, lost mines tile set or something that was in the game. Oh, right. That was one of the last things that, uh, that we put out, yeah. I guess, uh, last. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was yeah, between, I, thought that, uh, I thought that would look pretty cool. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I forgot how, plane that was when we got ours um we brought these discs out and the whole staff just brought their discs out and we all signed them so all of ours are all you know signed by everyone <laughs> else i never realized how simple and plain and black it was because it's got a bunch of scribbles of names of people who i really cherish and enjoy and i don't get to see anymore uh so <laughs> um it's yeah. not a bad thing for baits i just i i guess with all the D D miniature stuff i did growing up it mm -hmm. felt like it needed something <laughs> no, I guess that I guess that does make sense. I don't have a whole lot of. Um, I did have some toys and statues and stuff, but as the kids grew, they those things went away too because they either get broken or stolen to play with. Which, I mean, yeah, I guess that's a that's a good fate for a toy to get broken with <laughs> from play. Um, but yeah, no. Now I'm, now I'm working at home after uh, End Space um, went away, and um, uh, just been freelancing since. Um, picked up uh, Power Rangers three or four months after I left that place. So it was kind of a kind of floating around for a little bit and they created a mobile game called uh, Legacy Wars. And my friend Garrett, who had worked at Antspace previously, um, was working there. It's this company in San Francisco. They're making a mobile game on Power Rangers. Like, okay, I can write sound. I can, I can do sound design for that. Like, oh, and they need music too. Like, okay, that sounds cool. So... I started up with them on launching the title, creating a bunch of music for um, a show which I really didn't know anything about at all. Uh, I had to watch a lot of it to kind of get it. And even still, initially, there's this kind of uh, Power Rangers, really, isn't that that thing that, that like kids watch? And I know, I know that's a total... That's a total wrong way of doing it for any project in general. But even when I was a kid, I was like, oh, that's that's so that's I'm so above that I'm watching. I don't even know what what I was watching, but that was definitely not for me. Um, but what I didn't understand is um, Power Rangers still is playing today. There are new episodes today and um, every age that grows up, they have their favorite you know, season. And so there are kids now who are my age then when the first um, Power Rangers was going on, totally getting into it now, totally, the season that's out now is their favorite season and so every single season, every single character has a favorite uh, has a champion, you know and you can't look at one lightly and say like, ah that looks kind of cheap because someone's going to say that's not how he sounded or why did you give him that blaster and because they pay attention, just totally totally just like the Dungeons and Dragons crabs, those little details matter it's not they're not they're not flexible in in some ways you know you can't just turn someone uh like uh from a having an arrow uh, a bow to a crossbow like well yeah they're kind of both ranged instruments but they do two different things you know and so the fan service on this type of title is tantamount and so me learning to like the show me drinking the kool-aid of Power Rangers, <laughs> you know, essentially, <laughs> there's no other way of putting it, just totally buying into it. Um, I mean, it, that is totally what I did with Sword Coast. I did not play Dungeons and Dragons before then. Um, my dad thought it was evil, and I was not allowed to um, even consider, I wasn't allowed to watch Transformers because if cars uh, had a soul, then uh, God wanted that to happen. So God was clearly not involved in this. So these were demon um, robots. So there was a lot of stuff I couldn't watch as a kid, but um, uh, and Dungeons and Dragons was, was totally on the list. Um, Power Man, Rangers, and I was upset my parents wouldn't let me watch uh, MTV as a kid. 
<laughs> I didn't I didn't get I didn't have to miss out on Transformers. I missed out on a lot of MTV, but man. <laughs> oh no, no. I made sure I didn't miss out on Transformers. I there's <laughs> you stay up late, you go to cousin's house, so you what you do whatever. You had to watch the robots turning into a cars and vice versa cartoon <laughs> series. That was my world. I cried when Optimus died in the movie and I was scarred. Uh was and I I, I did and say what you will about the new movies, but the very first roll call in the very first movie, um, the the Michael Bay movies, I definitely teared up. I was like, because you see all these characters, you you hear the voice of, of Optimus Prime, and it just brings you back to that point. And um, uh, to circle back, I mean, my my whole career has been working on IPs like this, like Dungeons and Dragons or um, Power Rangers or. Uh, uh, Tron or all these cool titles that I've been a, been able to be a part of that are someone's favorite thing. And so treating those things with respect is, again, you know, tantamount. Learning as much as you can about the lore. I know all the characters from Power Rangers now. I know all the seasons. I know all the stuff. I'm still surprised by the by the people who really know and love it. Um, but uh, um, that's that's where I draw my inspiration from the shows and then the people who love the shows that drives me forward to make this product better. Uh, so I've been working on this project for um, three uh, with the company for three, four years. Now we've made a, a mobile title that did really well. And then they get the option of creating a console title, which is a total um, fighting game, fighting game, not the funny little thing with cards and you got to collect it or anything like that. This is a total console fighting game akin to i would say akin to street fighter just for you know for reference sake but in terms of a fighter it's what's known as a team fighter so they have um it's a three versus three um duel and you have a main character and at any time you can bring in your your guys and they can tag in they're called assists and so you have this team of up to six characters uh, fighting kind of all at once. Um, if you ever heard of a game called Marvel vs. Capcom or Marvel vs. Capcom 2, that series, yep. uh, that's kind of what we based it off of in terms of... Um, well, we, we look at all fighting games in ter- for, for inspiration. But that is probably the most... Um, the one that we look to in a spiritual kind of sense and a kind of a guidance way because that type of game... Uh, is a very specific kind of a frenetic, high action, a lot of chaos, a lot of controlled chaos. And again, like Power Rangers, like Dungeons & Dragons, when I saw that game, it was like, oh, that's way too spastic for me. I don't... It looks kind of interesting, but it also looks like I can get a seizure. So I'm just going to stick to Street Fighter, and I was... Uh, I played the game called Third Strike um, for way too many years. I had an arcade cabinet sitting outside of my office spoiled pig uh <laughs> would not would not touch marvel versus capcom just thought it was just way too spastic way too smash brothery just kind of jump off this nothing against smash brothers little smash brothers but it was something that again like it was just where's the where's the strategy in that where's the dueling in that um and again starting this project learning this uh learning this type of game has been eye-opening for me uh in terms of audio in terms of uh creating music for it has been absolutely um, made me a better designer, made me a better composer, made me a better father. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> She's playing Roblox. She wouldn't leave the room. She doesn't care that the AC is off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I owe tons to the team. I owe tons to the Power Ranger community who um, yeah, told us as much that I don't, I didn't I'm not that great of a team fighter. I'm not that great of a Power Ranger lore person, but um, I really respect what they have, the connection that they have, and I just try to tap into that. And that's that's been that's been a, a really really good experience. And I've been they've made me a better everything. And I think projects should do that. I think that as you go from a project to project, you should um, learn from it. You should grow from it. You should show some evolution for something because otherwise why are you doing this i don't want to do this and then do the exact same thing five years from now ten years from now i want to get better at it i want to do something bigger i want to do something different and and new and so um 
this has provided. I've been very, very lucky to have been doing the projects that I've had, uh, meet the people who I've been able to meet and connect with the the fans who I've been able to connect with. Been really, really lucky. So I try to be very open. I try to reach out to as many uh, the fans as possible. I go into the forums. I go into to. Um, po- I've done a Power Rangers podcast, you know, like this wasn't video. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I just, uh, I guess that's what it is. It's the connection that kind of draws me to it. So, so slightly curious because we we talked a little bit about well, a little bit about Salt Coast, and last time we had you on, you you mentioned some of the steps you took to create audio for Salt mm. Coast Legends, where it everything is original because nobody knows what a dragon sounds like or right, right. But in this game, you have all those well, movies, etc., TV shows to lean on. So yeah. does that constrict you or does that help you determining what should this impact sound like? What should this sword sound like? Well, uh, yeah. So the show is the Bible. And anytime there's a question as to what it should look or sound like or do, we just go to the show because that that is ultimately going to be what the people who have that connection with are going to know. They're going to have that in their head. Oh, she didn't say it like that. Oh, she didn't hold the gun that way. And when you hear those things, they seem like like nerdy nit nitpicky kind of things, but it's the total it's the total wrong attitude to have about it because again, these people have that connection to it, you don't. And if you make something that says that you do, they'll know. They 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 know. They they know right away, oh, they didn't they didn't they never even watch a show. If they had just watched one show, they would know that he holds it like this. Or that he didn't call him, you know, this until he transformed into it in the in the last season. So it, you you know, you, you want to pick on that kind of thing, but at the same time, that that's the important stuff. The the little tiny details. There's total enough time to make to put your own stamp on things. Uh, I think. Um, but in terms of like designing the sounds. I mean, I don't have any source material that was given to us. There was no like, here, here's all the impacts, here's all the blaster sounds, here's all this. Um, created from scratch, listening to the reference, oh, wow. marrying it with whatever is going on in the game. You know, if it, it again, it has to serve the game. Um, it has to touch on the IP. It has to have the IP in the center in it. But the gameplay is key, and. Um, because you can make a real, real fan servicey game that plays like shite, and <laughs> people play it for a while, for a while for the novelty of it, but it won't have any lasting effect. It'll yeah. it'll just kind of fade away as to that We've cool little novelty those. thing that, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's a, so it's a balancing thing. Yeah. So well, well, I guess when you, I remember from the last interview we did a while back, one of the things that stuck with me was you talked about recording your dogs. I think eating some <laughs> chicken. With Bones or something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to get a certain sound. Um, what kinds of things have you maybe had to do that are kind of interesting in a way that you you recorded something to create a sound for this game? Uh, the biggest things that I've had to create that I did a lot of like recording for would probably be the impact. And because that is like a racing game, it's the engines, like the like Sword Coast. It was a lot of the, the a lot of the combat, the swords and the and the impacts and everything like that. This thing again, it's it's the impacts, and so I when I first came out, uh, rather when I first started on it, my first batch of impacts sounded good, but what I was they sounded like good hits. Let's see here. <laughs> um, they sounded like really really good hits. They sounded uh, high fidelity. They sounded real. They sounded like a person hitting another person. Um, the thing that I learned most on this was because we're making that connection back to that arcade level to that kind of um over the top quality to it that the more synthetic they sounded the more kind of arcadey and retro even i don't i don't want to go too far to make it sound like it's dated but it had to feel larger than life arcadey over the top so a regular kind of you know smack wasn't going to do it you know it had to be accelerated heightened it almost it almost sounds like a splash like a sound versus a thud versus a you know there are some kind of impacts in there that have that kind of sub quality to it but um for this big arcade presentation I had to chuck a lot of the stuff that i'd made 
for the first three or four months, stuff that I had recorded. I went out and recorded them, um, you know, hitting body bags, um, grabbing a, a good one's uh, like a sack of potatoes. You kind of slack it against the ground. They make a they make a good quality kind of a thud and, and impact and a feel. And then they might be mixed in there still a little bit, but it got changed for the arcade kind of whack, zam, pow, kind of like colorful, cartoony, more designed sounds. I mean, the, the sounds that you hear uh, coming from, you know, um, Asian influences, those kind of impacts sound way different than the stuff that we make in the West. It's a, it's a big dichotomy. Matter of fact, Power Rangers itself, if you didn't know, is based off of a show called Super Sentai. And the premise of that show is um, uh, same kind of thing, except for in America, we took out all the American actors and then we swapped it out with the, uh, sorry, all the Japanese actors and swapped it out with American actors. So they see two different shows. And our show, the US show, is based off all the footage that they record over there. And so you can watch the show side by side, played entirely by different people, completely different storylines and everything. But all the robots and, and all the fighting and stuff is the same because we share that stuff. And their sound design is so much more kind of different and heightened. And, um, you know, you could probably think of that classic anime sword shing effect of chwang. It's, it's mm -hmm. What is that sound? It, it doesn't really sound like anything. But we all know what it is. And we all know how it makes us feel. And so I think in a way they tapped into that a little bit more so. So um, I... In, in the same way, I had to take my kind of sound designy um, mindset from creating everything that I've created before to thinking a little bit differently and shifting it into a, a realm that made it seem more, again, more arcadey, more fun, more kind of in your face, sometimes a little bit more abstract. So a lot of the stuff that I recorded ended up having to just be completely redesigned or melt in with some cool synthetic textures or whatever. And just straight up listening to a lot of the show and listening like, wow, what is that sound? Like it, if you heard the sound and you didn't see the visual, you'd have no idea what it was. It would just sound like this, okay, this cool thing, but you put an explosion on like, okay, that works for an explosion. And so with that, there's a kind of a freeingness of it. It kind of it allows you to just kind of think a little bit out of left field and say, will this work as a gunshot? Will this work as a as an explosion? Will this work, you know, and you kind of marry it up to it and it sinks and if it if it sounds good and it feels good, um, that's probably the most important thing. Uh, damned if it's uh, repeated too. It, for me, creating um, Sword Coast and other games like it, it was the bane of my existence to hear a sound repeat too much, whether it's a footstep or a sword swing or an impact or or the characters' emotes when they go uh 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 uh. It's the same one here and over and over, <laughs> and it, it totally takes you out. It pulls you back from this is, uh, you know, this this story to this is a game. Oh, I heard that same wolf cry again. I heard it again. I heard it again. And so going into uh, uh, Power Rangers, I went in with that mindset. I had 10 different impact sounds and 15 different whoosh sounds, and they're all randomized, and they're designed so that they'll never repeat themselves. And... Uh, voices especially if they had a grunt or something in there it wasn't the same grunt there's a batch of like 10 of them and probability of some silence in there to really kind of vary it up and uh, the combat designers who um are pro actually professional were professional uh, marvel versus combat players um gave me some tips and said hey um it's okay if things repeat As a matter of fact that's kind of the charm of a lot of these games is that they they sound um, they don't sound real. It's okay if you hear the same, uh, 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 the same impact, the same, every single time he pulls out a blast, photon ray, psh, photon ray, psh, photon ray, psh, photon ray, you know. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm remembering hearing in the arcades, and that totally sounds like what I hear in the back of an arcade. It totally sounds not like a real thing, not like, you, well, one, people wouldn't be saying the name of their attacks as they do them. But two, <laughs> they wouldn't say it every single time, would they? But no, they want us, we, they want to hear it over and over again. They want, uh, they want to hear that bit of feedback because that lets them know they did the move right, or they did a good move, or they did something 
it, it's part of that feedback loop for this type of game that makes more sense for it to be a little bit repetitive, a little bit uh, over the top, a little bit not quite this worldly, but it makes sense in context of the game. And so that's a complete mind shift for, for someone like me, but I'm learning to embrace it. I'm learning to just have one line per thing, and it's okay if he says it 10 times in a row because they don't have to press that button if they don't want, if it really don't want to hear it. And I haven't heard <laughs> any complaint about that at all. There's no one who's ever said like, oh, he said the same thing again. Oh, he said the same thing again. That's what they're expecting here. And I remember in, um, again, we're, we're, we'll go back to Sword Coast, the wolves in there, um, they sounded really sad when you hit them and we got a lot of complaints about them. And so I pulled some out and then we still get complaints that every time you hear that you hit them, they sound really sad. And so I kept pulling them out and adding some more variations to them. I said, well, now you added, you, you, you pulled them all out. Now we're hearing the same wolves over and over. Can you, can you add some more into the pool to vary it up? Because again, you hear the same thing over and over in that type of game and it pulls you out. And it's two different, two different worlds. And um, I'm grateful for learning that. Now, if I start another project, that may not work. <laughs> but um, it's working here pretty pretty well. And I just have to learn how to, to trust the trust the fans, trust the combat guys, because they know they, they, they create really, really amazing characters and they know how they're supposed to kind of feel. So again, I'm always, always learning. I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, and uh, every single project, I've been blessed to be able to learn stuff like this, everything I'm taking to the next one. So super, super lucky. I can actually, uh, when you say that, I'm thinking back to playing. Oh, sorry, there's an ambulance outside my window now. <laughs> I'm thinking back Stay to safe. Street Fighter 2. And it's correct because mm -hmm. it's the same. How you can, how you can, how you can. Uh, yep. It's mm -hmm. that thing repeated as opposed yep. to, yeah, just any variation in the intonation when they call out their attacks. Because that's something you do. I don't know why, but you should always say yeah. what you're doing when you're about to do it. Yeah, you, you call every name's got a, every move's got a name, and it's got to sound the same thing because uh, I think it stems a little bit more from the first like Street Fighter games where the execution of, you know, whoever, whoever could figure out how to do a fireball, like that person was God. Yeah, that was your, that was, your, that was the, the person who had figured out who was suddenly unbeatable because it was kind of, it was tough. The input on that was the same as it is now. But we have a—it's a lot more lenient now. The inputs are a lot more lenient for people because they want—they don't want people to not be able to do a fireball. So the the mechanics are the same, but they read it differently. They're a lot more lenient on the on the timing of it. Whereas before, it was pretty much frame accurate. And so having that again, when you did it right and you heard him say the right thing, it's that feedback loop. It comes back to you that says, "Yes, I did the right thing." I do against. Oh, it feels good. It feels good. It feels good. You're doing good. It's the rhythm of the game. It's the feedback flow of the game. To break it up or make them say something different or to have them not say something every once in a while, that would break well, them it, out of that loop. We focus a lot on the feedback that the player gets when they're hitting the buttons and the character that they're controlling, but I think that that also applies to the enemy on screen and the sounds that you hear when they make their different types of attacks mm -hmm. you know because then you know what you're getting hit with uh, or what's coming at oh, you right Telegram yeah yeah side. yeah absolutely yeah um and we do we do we have that in in this game uh, a lot there's a lot of stuff that um if you could hear what he's about to say you know exactly what to do if you got to jump if you got to duck or block or if you want to do some kind of crazy counter or something yeah it's totally about reading each other um and learning from that it totally, it, it brings me back to uh, you know Mike Tyson's punch out, which is that's all that game is. It's just watching the character. Is he dodging this way? Is he did he wink? Did he smile? Is he stepping this way? He does two steps this way. He's about to do an uppercut. I'm going to dodge. You know, you learn that language, um, and that that feedback loop, and that's what that's what that's all that game is. It's really more of a puzzle game than it is you know, like an action game. You have that uh, even in like modern that. games. Like if you take uh, Ubisoft, put out um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is the latest, um, but also mm -hmm. if you play like Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War, where you have these one-on-one -on -one combats. 
it is right. waiting for that attack is it do i dodge do i parry do i what do i do now okay mm -hmm. you see the details it's telegraphed now you act and then react yeah yeah all the the dark souls games the yeah. bloodborne games it's just thinking that one. Yeah. yeah yeah those are it's all about that's kind of telegraph. exact with it is they take the idea that was previously like saved just for like bosses and games but that is the game you know yeah um, it's a cool. It's a it's a cool idea. So that's why the, I think that's why those games do really well. It's that feedback loop, and it doesn't matter that you you did it, you that you died ten, twenty, thirty times on it because you're learning as you do it. You're you're slowly getting all the hints from it, and eventually you'll pass it. That's it's that's that's uh, super punch out. <laughs> is what that was. Eventually, you will get to the end. <laughs> you know. Um, so, but I want to dig into because you. Early on, you mentioned you recorded all these sound really high fidelity, and then you mm -hmm. had to sort of drop that or adapt them. But mm -hmm. also, this is a you know it's a multiplayer fight. There's what mm -hmm. two two versus two at times. I saw in some of the yep. videos. Sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't play it because yeah, Street Fighter <laughs> Two was the last fight game I played with any serious. <laughs> Sorry about that. But when Sorry. you have have all these characters, different characters, and multiple players at once. And you have all these sounds going off. You have a fairly large soundscape. Yeah. And do you narrow narrow down like impact sounds to who's hitting who, so the player can hear, "Oh, I hit," but the other guy is missed? Or do you like do do you limit them to different spectrums frequency wise, or do you just let them all wash together? Uh, I'd like to have a little bit more control over it. Um. But it's kind of like mixing fireworks live <laughs> because it doesn't, <laughs> it's really, really tough to account for everything that possibly could happen because we give the player such freedom. Again, you can, you have two players, uh, two tag team basically. It's like a three person, three versus three tag. Yeah. But then you can also call in a big robot as this huge, like, um, uh, kind of like a comeback mechanic. Um, and so your characters can come out and you can do an attack with a, a third one, a second one, and then a third one. And then your opponent can do the same thing, a second one, a third one. And then you can bring out your robot and suddenly there's seven different entities all kind of doing different things. I mean, the assists aren't in their free fighting. They kind of come in and do one attack and then they, and they pull out. Um, but even so, just those moments uh, makes it I basically had to mix this game by putting everyone like on God mode, giving everyone like infinite meter and then just watching the co computer play com like complete, like um, cheap asses, just throwing supers and EX moves and huge moves and just watching it and listening to it because I'm listening for those edge cases of things where it's, there's just too much stuff happening where there's too many impacts where someone, you know, fired off too many missiles or something, you know, and, um, I found that as many rules that I can create that says, okay, when there are four missiles on screen, I'm going to bring the missile volume down a little bit. And then when those done, I'm going to come back up. Doesn't matter how many rules are created. There's still someone that's going to kind of break the game and do something that I didn't <laughs> think about. So I pulled back from that really finite um, well, frequency carving and uh, just basically made a bunch of rules that, okay, we can only have this many impacts playing at a time. So it basically just kind of plays in the terms of like priority, whichever one's the first one, whichever one's, uh, you know, um, the most recent one is going to hit. And if there's five of them playing, it's going to kill the last one. Um, that's kind of a, a common thing just in terms of priority for sounds. Um, but I really just had to like, just change the volumes of stuff at the source level says, hey, this sound can play too much. I kind of want it to play up to this much, but it can go really, really loud. And um, I just had to go through and just tune a lot of sounds one by one for those things that just didn't sound great when they were stacked too much, or I can limit how much can play at a time. So it really just, I just, I control the amount that would play, but oh. in terms of like, yeah, frequency carving or anything like that, no. I mean, it's uh, it's re it's a it's a really really tough thing to do. If it were a one versus one, there's a lot more that you can expect. But with three versus three, and it's three different characters 
uh, six different characters in any given match, it takes a it, <laughs> it takes a lot to kind of mix. And so I'm still, you know, refining the mix as I play. I watch a lot of matches online. I'll just download. Uh, I pop into people's streams, uh, which they they really dig. I say, hey, how's it going? You know, they they all recognize me. You know, and I just want to watch the matches a little bit. You know, turn the sound up. So I'm watching the matches. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, Shut when up, you pull that it. guy out, he does this. Like, okay, so I take my little notes and I and I go back, and uh, I, in the next patch, it'll get some of my fixes and stuff. So I am kind of constantly tweaking okay. it, which I'm lucky to be able to do, because a lot of people will put a project out there and it, that's how it sounds. So I'm lucky to mm-hmm. really get new data and listen to it. Like, oh, that didn't sound good. I mean, it sounded great when we we're playing it, but I just watched this person stream. And it sounds horrible, and there's this weird delay on it. So I'm gonna, I can, I can fix that. I know what to do. It's a, I kind of treat the public as my QA, uh, <laughs> which, with a team kind of this small, it's a, it's a pretty small team, and they do have a great QA uh, team. But I'm still kind of the only person there who knows and does anything with audio, and that's, that's always been my case. It's always, you know, Sword Coast mm-hmm. uh, within space, solo audio guy. No one would ever kind of pay attention to me in that sense, which was great. I had a lot of autonomy with that and allowed me to kind of, you know, uh, do do whatever I wanted, really, which was cool. I mean, I get feedback from, from stuff, but for the most part, everything that I've been able to do has been pretty much unfiltered, you know, do even you, at the highest um, levels. On a game like this, because there are all the, these sounds going off at the same time, mm-hmm. um, do you get to at least separate them spatially then? That you know whether they're behind you, yeah. or front of you. Oh well, it's just a left and right plane, yeah, so I it's a t- was... essentially a two D game, right? Yeah. Um, there are some sounds that um, naturally feel closer to you, and there's some sounds that naturally feel farther away in general. But where I'm really just, I'm not really experimenting a whole lot with like uh, with with any kind of surround, with any kind of real depth of, with it, other than just kind of like the basic mix. Some attacks that feel bigger. You know, they they um, they'll be given you know priority volume kind of stuff, and it's other sounds that you want to push back. You give them a little bit more for so yeah, you do play with depth a little bit um, on the design side, but again, as a two D game for the most part, it's just panning for the most part. So, um, but I mean that's that plays a huge a huge huge part of it, especially when people are playing in less than stellar. You know, audio systems, which is always my my biggest um, biggest challenge, is making things sound good on every single system. And what's the most current, you know, common thing? The most common thing now is sound bars. People still have sound bars, and if you're not familiar with the sound bars, it's this bar that makes sound. And it's like it's like an emulation of a 2.1 system, I guess, or a, or a 3.1. It's like left and right and a center channel, and maybe you have a sub with it. And uh, I've heard some; they sound kind of okay, but they they can also make the the sound feel very narrow. Um, they tend to have some three so, D simulation in them. That, yeah, that or they'll have some three D, which will put some sounds out of phase, and you won't even hear things because, like, what? How come you didn't hear that impact? And turn off the three D, you know, acceleration or whatever, and like, oh, there it is, because yeah. it's 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 a little bit of the wild west. There there are standards out there. Um, but in terms of making game and game audio, it still is pretty much the Wild West. You just have to listen to it on as many places as you can. Oh, you listen to it on, on crappy laptops, you listen to it on big mains, you listen to it on cheap sound bars, you listen to it on a TV that you bought for 20 bucks from a discount store. You just listen to it, listen to it, listen to it. So um, that's I still I still do that. That's, that's what I do now. I pull it up on my phone and I'll watch so, a stream. I'm like, oh... I mean, maybe my, maybe my target isn't phone, but it is something interesting about the way that the mobile uh, reproduces sound that can tell you information about how your sound is being received generally. Mm. High frequencies, low frequencies, that kind of stuff. Mobile doesn't really do low frequencies at all. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's just paying paying attention and being, being I swear I was going to say stalwart, but uh, just persistent, persistent, yeah, just being persistent and, and trying to better, better it as you can. I would say, people get get some of these nice IEMs. Oh yeah, that'd be great. It, see, that's the thing. It, it almost wouldn't matter if this if the end uh, product 
were a good product or a bad product. If everyone had the same one, it'd be much easier to mix for. Yeah. You know, if everyone had the same setup, then it would just be a given. I'd know exactly what it sounds like. And then I know that when they play it, they're going to hear the exact same thing as I do. So, yeah, it's um, that's that's as far as I know, that's a challenge for every single every single piece of media is to make it sound good uh, everywhere. Um, I'm still still chasing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, also, have, it's unfair you know, saying you know get an in-ear monitor that's perhaps a little bit excessive i saw one of those drowned new headphones there are a hundred a hundred dollars just for earphones not ah, yeah yeah not everybody's going to get those right or yeah the big ear cans where well, they come up to what three four hundred for beats yeah 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 no absolutely yeah uh i mean beats are a marketed one so they've got a i mean there's pros and cons about them i think they sound kind of flat but in general they're not bad consumer headphones but for the price it's that's kind of ridiculous it's more of a more of a fashion statement i guess than anything else than like production i'd say yeah. not to not to crap at anyone who has beats and like them because if you like them and they work for you that's fine yeah, tuned for a different uh, from a production purpose. standpoint i mean no. i mean these things here these are what are these uh sennheisers these are old these are very very old these are like the same model that i got when i left full sale and uh which is 2006 so these are maybe two years after that i bought them because just because i i knew the sound you know you, you get comfortable with what they sound like and so when it was time to buy them I bought them again 150 bucks that's a so bad problem i have with these because i picked these off of uh, amazon and i'm not joking 16 pounds they are the best yeah. they're the cleanest sounding earphones i've ever heard oh nice yeah but um they are, uh, the, the brand doesn't exist if you google them they don't exist so I can never buy another pair because <laughs> Amazon doesn't have them. It was just they were there, and now they're gone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So have you had an opportunity? I know, like with Sword Coast, you got a chance to do some voiceover work as well. Have you? Are you mainly just doing sound design and music, or are you getting a chance to do other things uh, on the game as well? Or. Uh, so yeah, uh, I got to voice a character, which I was really trying not to do. Like I, I knew that I was, I knew that I wanted to voice some characters because I, I really, really do like voicing stuff. Um, but I, I was leery about turning it into like the Tony show, which is kind of, which I don't, I, I find I actually don't have a problem with. I like doing a little bit of everything. I like working promotional stuff. I like working on trailers. I like working on sound design, music, voice all that stuff. Um, but I was just, I just wanted to be cautious about it. Like it wasn't just like me being, you know, either like manipulative or capitalistic or whatever, self-serving agenda, just, you know, egotistical trip. But I guess there's a part of that that's always kind of mixed in. Um, yeah. I got to do uh, a character, a really badass character called Daishi, uh, big, uh, lion character, big evil, kind of demon character if you're familiar I, that's kind of the voice that, it, that that usually comes out of me the easiest in terms of that kind of stuff these really big voices that thunder from the sky you know these <laughs> very evil things are like what did you just say to me <laughs> um, <laughs> so this character was um uh what we do is whenever whenever we do a new character we talk to hasbro or whoever see if they have any contacts with the original actor who played it um, or someone who they would trust. And we had, at, at launch, we got uh, JDF, J Jason David Frank, uh, Austin St. John, who played the Red Ranger. Um, uh, I'm going to forget all the names. We got a lot of original actors playing their parts uh, for our game, which is great. Now, so we have a story mode. They did that. And they also did all the, the combat stuff, the grunts and everything. And so that adds a great level of authenticity to the game. That We have the actual original actors in there. Uh, but not for everyone. Uh, some of the actors are not available, not interested, or um, are, uh, have passed. And that happened with um, one of the characters that ha that was released right before mine. And I think at the time, I was just telling myself, you know what, I think I should just do the next character so we don't even have to worry about this. It was the last character in the season. And we'll, we'll cross the next bridge when we get to it, but I'll just handle this next one. I kind of eyeballed it uh, from before because it was a big... Um, black evil lion creature that uh, was possessing uh, like a, a good guy. I guess he's a fellow ranger named Jared. Um, actually, Jared wasn't actually a ranger, uh, but he was a friend of the rangers of the, of the season called Jungle Fury. 
and he was taken over by uh, an evil uh, beast, an evil demon called Daishi, which basically lived inside of him. And uh, eventually, there was a big climactic, uh, you know, fight with him at the end. And he's this big, huge demon character. And he, in the show, the character that that spoke for him, I could tell that they just pitched the voice down. He just had he had a regular speaking voice, and then they lowered it kind of artificially. And it didn't sound bad, but you know, um, I thought that it would be much more fun to make it a little bit more evil and uh, a little bit darker and fans recognized that it did not sound like the original guy <laughs> but because it sounded so good i got a pass uh, <laughs> they they liked it they some people said they liked it more than the original um because it it definitely had a more of a before it was just this guy and he's you do not know me. I am the real Daishi. And, and instead, I, I brought a lot more kind of a growl to it and re, really darker. And, you know, this just really evil quality to it. And then I pitched it down a little bit, just a little bit lower than my than had I had I recorded it. And it just has this really kind of big, evil sound to it. And so when it came out, everyone's like, what the hell is this? I had to find <laughs> out, who, you know. Who, who who is this character? Who the hell did you get to voice it? Oh, it's the sound guy. You got the sound guy to do it. You... He also wrote all the music, and so that's kind of what I didn't want to happen. I didn't want it to be like that, where it was suddenly this thing like I was, you know, like on a power trip or something. I, I was trying to be careful about that. So I knew I wanted to do a character at one point, but this one I just I couldn't pass it up. It just like like when Belafoss, when I was able to do Belafoss, that was pretty. That was pretty badass because we had actually casted Belafoss. We actually had a voice for him, and he sounded good, but it wasn't the quality that we wanted. It was um actually the uh, what's the dwarf's name? I'm forgetting this. The uh, in Sword Coast, the the main uh, Laura 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 Larathar, right? Larathar. Oh, okay. The guy who did that voice, he's got a, a deep, scratchy voice, and apparently he's known in, in voice actor circles for doing other characters. I actually don't remember who he was. But he kind of had this voice, and he talked like this, and he had, you know, he had a great kind of gravelly voice, and so I guess at the time they thought they would cast him for it. And he did he did sound good, but we we felt that we wanted to make it more evil, and they knew that I can do an evil voice, and uh, the writer uh, of the of the uh, of the story, Jay Jay Turner, um, we were you know we hit it off really well, and he knew that I did this voice, and so he started kind of writing it more towards the stuff that I would say, and uh, so that's kind of how that that's kind of how that came about. It was <laughs> both opportunity and like you know what this guy sounds a little better. I mean, we should have him do it. I mean, we did pay this other guy, and the guy got paid to do it, whether we used it or not. Um, but, uh, ultimately it went to me. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm, it's an easy voice for me to pull off for some reason. I have no idea why I have a big evil voice. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, when this character came out in, in, in this one, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't say no to it. If we're going to do some more promotional stuff when the next character come out, which, um, we just had the, the, uh, trailer that came out yesterday for the new characters that came out and the new character is plays in the same season as the character that I voiced. And so when we release them, we're probably going to do some kind of promotional stuff that's going to have both of them have at it at some bit. So I'll be able to do that voice again. And that's good. That's fun. Uh, so that's, that's, that's totally on my Twitter thing now, you know, sounds designer <laughs> power Rangers and voice of Daishi. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a cool badge. I get, I get to wear, I guess, uh, at least in the, in that circle. And again, it's just another big evil voice that I get to do. Um, available for children parties as well. Uh, I was going to say, I I get this this picture in my head of you standing there with your hands on your hips, you know, using that voice to tell your kids that they need to get in bed and go to sleep or do their uh, homework or something. <laughs> I, I have no power over my kids. They eh? they don't <laughs> they don't listen to what I say. They don't play any of the games that I make. Uh, they are too busy in Minecraft and Roblox. Uh, mm. To do it, to to yeah, that that's not cool. Uh, the older one is um, is learning. She 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 pays attention. She's very interested in. It. She likes writing music. 
Uh, she likes um, kind of game designy kind of stuff. And as a matter of fact, uh, she voiced the um, second character in the trailer that we just did. We released three characters. One was RJ from um, Jungle Fury. The second one was, uh, her name is um, Lauren Shiva from Samurai, um, Power Ranger Samurai, uh, the red leader character, whatever. And we have not casted that person yet. Uh, we may be, we're not, um, I don't know who exactly we're going to get. We'll get somebody. But I needed someone for just to say something. Go, go, Samurai. It's all I need her to say. Go, go, Samurai. And I, I couldn't think of anyone here now uh, who, during our uh, quarantining, that I'd be able to call and say, can you come over to my house and record? I couldn't think of who I was going to do. I could probably, maybe I could find someone online and pay them some money to do it, whatever. But I was thinking, who am I going to find here to, to do this? And I heard my, I heard my daughter, she's 16 now, heard my daughter, you know, kind of, kind of yell at her sister. And she didn't sound like, you know, a little kid anymore. She had some really uh, dark overtones. Cause I guess, I don't know <laughs> either. Some of that from me is coming down to her or, <laughs> uh, she some something that her sister did that really really pissed her off and so she was yelling at her and i said you know what she can project if i can just get her in here to say a few things uh maybe she would really do it you know and i'd always kind of presented the opportunity to her before but you know she was was she she sounded too young and without that confidence behind you to, to speak even a person with a good quality voice if you don't have that confidence behind you they'll they'll know it'll sound like Oh, I'm talking into a microphone. It sounds like this. You're acting, you're emoting in such a horrible, horrible way. You, with these characters, you have to go out. You have to just emote and 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 be an idiot in the room and say something ridiculous like "Go, go, samurai." Um, and so she did it for me, and I put it in there, and everyone didn't think anything of it it was just it was totally fine with them i finally told him like yeah that was my daughter she just said that I'm like oh okay so now i'm getting into her mind thinking like you know what why don't we go ahead before this is cast why don't we create some placeholders and we'll just have you recording and we'll have you do the character and if they like it maybe you can get into the game but you have to do it well i'm not going to put it in unless it sounds good so you have to do well you know perform for your dad <laughs> But um, but I mean honestly I wouldn't I wouldn't if it didn't sound good I wouldn't put her out there like that you know if it sounds good and she's something that she's proud about and it's up to, to the level it's just totally not a, a wouldn't be a nepotism thing it is because I'm using her but it has to sound good too and I told her that too I said look don't get mad if when you record it and I say okay good and then later on I swap it out with something else because if it ultimately doesn't sound good to me or to someone else. It can get zapped. It can get axed, and it can and it happens all the time. It happens way more than you think. Um, don't feel bad about it, right? Sixteen year old. Okay, please. <laughs> but no, she <laughs> she was total sport about it, total game about it. Had a lot of fun with it, and so much so that yeah, she likes the idea of you know, maybe doing some more voice roles for that. And I I would get behind that too. It's a it's a cool thing to get into. I wish I had started it. A lot sooner like all my voice roles just came with like the projects that i was doing um but i've never actually done a voice role uh for something that i had no like like i auditioned for or didn't know someone in the project or or, or something like that true voice act true voice acting um you know uh business kind of stuff so i would i would totally support that so but she's still figuring herself out she's um She's creative like me, and she wants to do a lot of different things. It's it's all about harnessing it and finding a trajectory and going into it. I mean, she has a lot of time. She has a lot of time to, to do it right. She has a lot of time to screw up, and now is the time to screw up. Now is the time to, you know, to make those mistakes. You know, I tell them all the time in, in school, it's okay. You know, I'm not too worried about, like, bad grades. I'm not too worried about this. I, I am more wanting to see that you keep trying and you keep learning because you'll get it eventually you everyone learns at different rates yeah you know i'll admit so if there was one skill i would love to have practiced it's voice acting yeah yeah that is, there were some coming up in my twitter feed where you could basically take lessons you know voice acting lessons oh 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet there's, yeah. T- uh, but there's tons of that going on now. Yeah. yeah. I'm still on my um, should do, should do, should not do. <sighs> but it just it depends on what you want to do with it, right? If yeah. you want to, if if you just want to be in a few cool little projects, that stuff can happen pretty easy. You know, just in, right now in my mind, I'm hearing your accent right here. Like, and you know, if I think if I ever have a project that needs that kind of voice right there, I might come and bug you for something like that. Oh, sure. Hey, can you go into your record and and, and say, <laughs> I you know I love this brand sandwich. I'll you know whatever. Um, but it depends on what you want to do. If you want to do projects that you like that you want to do, or if you just want to be just a straight up voice actor, which is really really tough because you got to do a lot of stuff that you don't like that you don't care about. And you have to do it how they sound, how they want you to sound. Yeah. There's kind of a, a fixed way of, of how they expect you to say it. I went in for um, right after I graduated school, a friend of mine went to record uh, work in a voice production suite where they make commercials, and he's and he knew I had a great voice. He said, "Why don't you come on in and, and and audition?" And so I went in, and I started reading this copy for these commercials. And uh, the guy at, at the other end who was directing me, he was not having any of it. Said, "Look, can you drop the scratchiness and just kind of say it like this? Like, no, no, no. Let me play it for you. How this other guy said it? Can you say it just like that? Uh, okay, okay. That's. No, 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 give you another one. Can you say this again? Like, uh, okay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, they don't say it like that. They're gonna say it like this. Like, they have a predetermined way of how it's supposed to sound, and they are not interested in." Um, your interpretation of it. Well, I find that, uh, that is, in the U.S., you seem to have there's that one way that things have to sound. Mm-hmm. There's that radio voice that also carries mm-hmm. over into yeah into TV ads. And if it doesn't sound like that, then the, the rest doesn't really matter. It's, we we don't have yeah. it over here. It here is much more range. I'm going to say less polished, but as a result, yeah. more natural. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, uh, yeah, that's that's that is that is exactly it, and that's what they're looking for because they're looking for the surefire hits. No one wants to take a chance. Yeah, no one wants to um, say, yeah, you know, that is interesting. Let's see if we can make something out of that. No, 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 no. We know what will sell. We know what will uh, bring in an audience. This is what it is. We're not interested. And in Therefore, we're else. going for that. No. Um, yeah. I also want to jump back when you said you know you you had your daughter sixteen uh, mm-hmm. do the voice and the recording. Here in this quarantine, quarantine time, you know, mm-hmm. we're all either isolated or quarantined, means different things. Um, right. Homework, right? <laughs> homework is difficult. And we're having to hand in homework for music classes and for um, presentation. <laughs> so I'm having my kids, you can see the mic here, she's sitting there singing. Ha- recording my 10 year old was an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And we're having. No, God uh, bless music teachers. God bless music oh, teachers. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> but one of them, I'm not joking. She assigned my uh, 13-year-old um, Bach's Fifth, the fourth piece, uh, "Ode to Joy." Mm-hmm. Yeah, on piano, as homework. Ding 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 ding. You know, it has to have some volume to it. We're in Brussels mm-hmm. after all. It's going like, oh, yeah. <laughs> as homework during this time, and I have to figure out recording her and getting, you know, full size uh, piano. Well, uh, 61 keys is mm-hmm. big enough for this, um, plenty big enough. Yeah. Get that on camera so the teacher can see that it's her playing. Holy right. shit. And then yeah. convincing a 13 year old to get recorded because that's what the teacher wants. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The uh, the 16 year old has uh, uh, is in orchestra. <laughs> How's it going? Hey. Uh, <laughs> the 16-year-old has a, um, uh, she plays the violin as well, mm-hmm. and she's in an orchestra. And I, that orchestra is just basically falling apart. I mean, they're doing lessons, and uh, I know they're watching videos, and they kind of record themselves. She was over here recording herself for the class. But yeah, I mean, that's what an orchestra does. I mean, you can go to someone and learn an instrument, but part of the orchestra is that you are blending all the sounds together. It's how everything fits. It's how everything uh, moves. And so learn you. there's really only one way of learning to play with an orchestra, just being in that orchestra, being in that yeah. chair, understanding the spatial qualities of this room, being able to see uh, the conductor, being able to you know be in tune with the people around you, you know, that 
that's the orchestra experience. And so there's a lot of stuff I really, really like about uh, the distance learning, but there's a lot of stuff that um, that doesn't work outside of just like the social aspects of seeing people walking upright and with shoes um, that you, you would completely miss. And so, yeah, orchestra is a, is a huge thing. The music thing, the arts is, you know, that and PE. I don't know how they're, I, I have no idea what they're doing to enforce PE. I remember getting an email from the PE coach saying, we want you to do this and this and that. And they're not doing anything. I'm not, I don't know how to enforce it. We offer- have you done your push-ups today? Yes. Yeah. Check it off. All right. We offer to, uh, with the PE, we have a uh, elliptical trainer. You can't tell it mm-hmm. on me, I know. But, uh, <laughs> we have one of those elliptical trainers you stand on and said, look, I can record because it has Bluetooth, um, so the phone records the activity levels. We can ah. do that. Um, but also, d- simple things, you can get a little kickstand for the bikes. Mm-hmm. So somebody, you know, bike in your living room and get a bike computer and then connect that to the phone and send that off to the teacher. There are weird ways. I, I Oh, yeah. That, just Google mm-hmm. Fit. Every, if any sports teacher, fit, phys ed teacher, is it. Google Fit. Kid puts it in the back pocket and they do push-ups. It records it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There, there are plenty of ways yeah. of tracking the activity without being camera, without being filmed, because nobody wanted to be filmed when they're sweating. Um, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, see what who kind of, has that's kind of weird, too. Xbox with Kinect, Xbox 360s. Anybody who has that? There's mm-hmm. plenty of sports things that can track. Absolutely, to the the you can get a you can get a great workout doing connect stuff. Yeah, uh, just 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 the flailing of your arms around for a while is is good. But they actually do like make like exercise stuff. I worked <laughs> with Enspace on a connect uh, exercise game with Jillian Michaels. And, I have that um, one. You have that one, the jungle one. Jillian Michaels on Xbox. I have that somewhere. The, <laughs> for Kinect. She, she made a she made a few. Yes, it's a Connect game. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, she's, ha- I only saw one, and uh, there might be more, but I have at least one of her Connect games. Okay. Yeah, I did. I that was. Uh, I think that was probably like my first like console music <laughs> uh, a credit was writing music for that. Um, and most of it was just handling dialogue and making sounds and stuff like that, uh, you know, interface sounds, collecting coins, or whatever. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, that was kind of interesting. That was, uh, but, but yeah, connect in general, total, total real thing that people should be, I don't know, as we move into the next year and as some, you know, societies are not able to completely open up or maybe shouldn't open up, uh, they should look into things like that. That's a total you know, yeah, yeah. I, I have, I've got a a, a smart watch that has uh, has all the Google Fit stuff on it, and it it notices when I'm doing something. It says, "Hey, are you working out now?" Like, uh, no, but uh, if this counts, good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it keeps track of my steps. It can, and we've yeah. got some gym stuff. The the thing I think we're fight fighting right now is because um, uh, we're in Florida. Drac, are you in Florida? No, I'm in San Diego. I thought you were in Florida. Weren't you? No, I'm on the other side of the country. Okay. All right. Even so, I'm in Florida and it is hot <laughs> and it is wet and it is a fight to get them to go outside to do anything. I've got a trampoline out there. We're going to be, uh, we've got a, a bit of a gym out in the shed with some equipment. They don't want to go outside. <laughs> slip and slide. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've totally made a, a redneck slip and slide out here too. With just, you know, <laughs> Get their 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 they have a real like climb up slide and I just put a hose up the top of it and it's like a real slip and slide they could totally go down it but um they don't want to they don't want to do that so we're we're gonna we're building a pool and maybe that'll get them out there um but no in terms of like PE I, I can't convince them to do something active it's already so hot over here Yikes. and it hasn't even gotten into the bulk of summer yet so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe if I can get the Connect working again and show them some titles and to say, "Hey, just go play Connect for an hour." Yeah, you know, they're like, "Oh, cool! I get to play." You know, that's fine. Just I've been doing get more active. You know, yeah, I've been doing a little bit of that in VR. I need to do some more, but yeah, I've been there's a couple of VR games, especially like rhythm type games, where you can get a, a nice workout playing that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been watching. I've been watching this. I don't have VR stuff. Um, my wife, who is not a big gamer, always looks at that kind of stuff, and she she likes some. Um, there used to be this. Uh, it's like a police trainer kind of game, 
where you're ducking and squatting and you're shooting at the same time. For some reason, she would spend, you know, so much of her money at, at the arcade playing that one game. She says if that ever came home, she said she would love that. She would have the greatest thighs in the world because of all the squatting and, and, and leaning and stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, now maybe the time to grab some VR. Though. I bet you there's a lot of really cool, cool, shooty, spendy games these days. I don't know. Space Pirate Trainer. Get that one. Space Pirate Trainer? Yeah, it is a VR game. Um, okay. I met the developers last year. Nice guys, but it is really... You You stand in one spot and you have to dodge all the shots coming at you and then you have to shoot all mm -hmm. the things coming. But it is space thing, so it's like alien spaceships coming at you. And then you nice. have different weapons and different hands that shield and stuff. You duck down and stuff. It works excellently. You can get an exercise out of it and it's fun. Well, what's the best uh, VR thing to buy right now? The, 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 the well, if, if you want to go top of the line, I'd say you want you know to have a nice high-end PC with a Valve Index. But if you're looking to get in on lower end where it doesn't cost as much, then probably the cheapest option is probably, uh, Geo, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably PSVR. Um, right now, there PS4, are cheaper options. PS4, PS4 yeah, Pro, and then the PSVR will set you probably around 800 right now, I think, seven 800 that's a yeah, and depending on depending on what capabilities your current computer already has if you know if it's a quote unquote gaming laptop with the ability to handle VR you can even get a lower end system something like what I have because I couldn't afford to go top of the line I got a Samsung Odyssey uh, it's an HMD Odyssey I think is what the, the name of it is and I want to say it was just a little over three hundred dollars um, the difference with the headset that I have versus something like the uh, the Valve Index or or some of the other more expensive ones is they have external cameras, whereas mine uh, it has I think two cameras on the front to track your hands. So if your hands go too far to the side, it'll lose the tracking. But it still has worked really well for most things in VR. Now, I, I would say throwing things or shooting a bow. Um, or in some cases, depending on how you might be holding the, the controllers to shoot a rifle or something, mm. those are a little bit wonky, but that's because of the placement of where those cameras are to track your hands. Um, okay. So you have some options. Yeah, and I, I'm really glad that this round of VR is sticking around because um, if you've watched the industry, they've they've pushed VR for a while and things have come out. And um, is this the, you know, is this the thing that's, VR is going to be, you know, writing in on like it hasn't hit yet, but I see that it's they're 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 widening the market. I can see that, and there's a lot more titles, and sometimes that's all it needs. It just needs like that, let's quote killer app, right? To just like ev that everyone's got to try out, you know. And I think one of them that everyone always sees right now is like something like Beat Saber, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's that seems like a, a really cool idea. When I see it, I think that looks fun. It it instantly you have an instant connection as to what exactly it is you're doing and so you're kind of sold on the idea like yeah if it tracks me and it feels responsive then that you know i'm, I'm sold on that so um yeah yeah i, I, sh I should i've I should probably i've done all kinds of stuff with the headset that i have because i've been testing different things just to see what i can do and and which different games I, i've even played skyrim uh with the headset that i have and it it okay. seems to work fine so far with that other than trying to shoot an arrow, like I was saying, you know, that's a little bit wonky. But, um, but yeah, no, it's I, actually getting to play Skyrim in VR is actually pretty amazing. <laughs> that's cool. But because like you, you, they have you pulling your hand like all the way back, like behind, it's total camera, so it's not position of this in relation to anything else. It's right. Just what's the yeah. In review. Okay. Well, yeah, and so aiming it is a little bit wonky too, because whereas if you had external cameras and it measures that stuff differently, if you pull back like you know like this, then mm -hmm. it sees where your hand is in relation to where the the goggles are and how your hand. But when that when it loses that tracking, or when you're trying to hold your hands both of them in front of you like this, now all of a sudden your aim is off. So you have to compensate for that in how you're you're placing your hands, and it. It's just, it's one of those things. I have a lower end headset. I know that. And I just have mm -hmm. to figure it out and compensate for it as I'm playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's that one called? Uh, that's the Samsung HMD Odyssey. Okay. Uh, after we're done, I can send you a link to it somewhere. I'll find it. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I I wish you can. Um, I know some arcades have like VR machines now where you go on and there's like a goggle 
uh, element to it, something too. But it seems like it is one of those things, like almost like a guitar. Like I can see a cool guitar online, but I kind of want to hold it and play it a little bit and want to see it a little bit. So with like with like VR, you kind of want to. I want to see. I like. I understand what it's supposed to be doing, but maybe my either my expectations are so far out there, or I'm should be prepared to have my mind blow, and I want to you know kind of experience it and feel like yeah yeah I want to buy into this you know. Well, a good place to do stuff like that, at least before all of this stuff, I, I think that there were some stores, some Best Buy stores, that uh, might have had demo yeah, units. Like a right. kiosk or something, yeah. Yeah, but but another really good place that I would assume you might have easy, easier access to is gaming conventions. Um, there are several <laughs> gaming conventions I went to, even small ones, like at some of the universities here in San Diego, or even large ones like at Comic-Con where there were VR games that they were demoing on different VR systems. And so you got an opportunity to put the headset on and feel the controllers in your hand, do things. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I was going to go to, um, GDC, uh, which was in the middle of March. Yeah. And then, uh, all this happened and, uh, they canceled that. It was like one of the first kind of like big conventions that got canceled, uh, that everyone paid attention. Like, Oh, we're starting to cancel this thing. Huh? And then the, took weeks and st- to get my my airline and everything you know uh, refunded and stuff and now I, I well you didn't get refunded you get a credit so whenever i think it's safe again to fly i have you know a few hundred dollars in credits to go to go fly out there but yeah uh gdc would have been one of my uh, that i hadn't been in years that yeah they would probably have a lot of games mo- maybe more so in development but all the same probably could check out a lot of stuff there too and they probably have a lot of things to test out on or e3 which that got canceled as well everything <laughs> well even check Literally. yeah yeah but but even check uh like some of the local universities mm-hmm. because i know there's uh like for instance um wasn't sdsu it was ucsd uh has their winter game fest and uh there were a lot of developers it, it was just it was folks who were in the computing department uh in the university that were showing off things that they were building uh, so you might even be able to find something like that, a smaller convention. You get a little more one-on-one with, with the folks that are there. I actually found that um, the big conventions are really cool to go to, but a lot of times the smaller ones uh, are, are, are are better in some ways because of that interaction that you get. Yeah, not as loud. Uh, <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, familiar familiar with that. Everything is, uh, everything is really, 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 really loud. You can't, I've had, yeah horrible times at conventions because I couldn't hear a dang thing. My ears were ringing. I had to leave just to kind of breathe. And I'm like, man, I paid money to, to fly here, to be here at my hotel. And I'm hanging out outside because it's too it's too loud inside. And I'm an audio engineer, so I think about it at that time all the time. Every time I go into a room and it's too loud, I'm like, oh, man, you're the, guy, you're the grandpa pulling out the cotton at a concert. You know, well, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is how I make doing my money. That yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Movie theater. I, ha- I haven't actually done that yet because it always surprises me. But yeah, movie theaters are notoriously bad for just every once in a while having a crap mix of something or something's just just way over, way too loud. Or they may have had it set for um, a, a full crowd, and you're there with you know like at a matinee, and they haven't uh, reduced the gain on that because, I mean, people absorb. Uh-huh sound so they would have to bump it up a little bit if you got a full crowd but if you're at a matinee and they're doing the same mix yeah i've heard of that too uh but yeah i could so i could totally see taking taking some ear uh, some ear plugs to a movie <laughs> but i used to have them with me all the time because they would just just end up in a place like ah oh, man like pull them out again like what are you doing oh i'm putting ear like ear earmuffs so like, ear ear plug earmuffs yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. Always, always, uh, always pay attention to your ears. It's was, was funny because my wife always tells me, like, I don't understand. You get paid to listen, but you don't hear a thing I say. It's <laughs> okay. a good one. That's a real, I'm going to think about that. <laughs> oh, she's great. Oh. I don't know what conventions you have over on your side here. Um, Gamescom is good because they separated the public and the private business area. So in the oh, okay. in the business area, it's much easier to to deal with things. Uh, hmm. 
to hear things. I can't when I'm in the uh, public area. It's also just yeah. For me, it's just one loud like a din almost. Just all the ah. are going together. But when you get into the business area, like, yeah, now now I can communicate. I can talk to people without shouting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can't hmm. stand the other one anymore. Well, I think I can speak for uh, both G and I that we would love to keep chatting, but uh, we usually target about 45 minutes to an hour, and we're on an hour and a half, which I love well, all of this. We had that yeah, I, we've, time been, we've been going. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. The time I, I, by. I, no. I start talking, and then uh, no. start talking about something else, and then talk about something else, and then talk about something else. I like but, talking uh, sometimes. <laughs> But before we get out of here, um, since sure. you've been on the show before, we asked before, you know, what kind of bacon you liked and, and what kind of beverage, uh, you know, be it beer site or whatever that you'd pair with it. And I know that back then uh, what your answer was a, a center thick cut fresh from the butcher and pair it with a Newcastle. So this time Ooh. What I'd like to ask is uh, it'll be a two part yeah, question. Good. <laughs> so the first part will be um, Think about bacon. <laughs> what kind of bacon would you make if you had your choice of any kind of pig in the world and how would you prepare that bacon that'll be the first part any kind of pig in the world yeah Ooh. We must stand together and if hmm to each other's aid, uh so for the fate of reality, we've got a lot of uh wild pigs out here <laughs> And uh, they're pretty, they're pretty mean things out here. But I heard they they taste delicious. <laughs> there are people who go hogging just to catch these and and cook them. And uh, what I've heard is that they taste uh, so much. Um, um, what's the word? I, I want to say juicier, but that's not the right word. They just they just have a. I, I'm assuming they taste better uh, because that's. Uh, that's what they do around here. They go, they go hogging just because the, the, the pork tastes so good out of it. So I guess I would, if that's what, if that's the kind of answer we're looking for, like something out of that kind of a hog or that kind of a pig, because I, I okay. actually don't know very many of the pigs, pig types <laughs> besides the ones that sing and dance in my kids' movies. Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because this, this part of this question came from uh, a little while back, Bam and I had an opportunity to interview a, a self-professed Baconista over in, I think it was Denmark. Yeah. Copenhagen. Uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah. That's so, uh, and, and, and he said the one type of pig that he hadn't had an opportunity yet, cause he, he sources pigs, uh, bake, bacon from pigs all over the place. And the one he hadn't had an opportunity yet that he would have wanted to get his hands on to try is a warthog. And we're like, you're going to make bacon out of Pumba? <laughs> 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 uh, so that, the, the second part of that, that question then would be, uh, if you were going to introduce someone else to the wondrous world of bacon, what type of bacon would you serve them? Why that type? And what beverage would you pair that with? Uh, well, actually, I mean, not, not just to go back to the first answer, but because that's, that's a common thing that I do is I'll get them some of the butcher bacon, some of the center cut butcher bacon, because it turns, again, it must, maybe it's like my idea about going to, to the to the wild pig, at least what that would taste like, but people who bought just regular package store bacon, like, well, it's not bad, because it's still bacon, right? There's no matter, there, there's like, there's a low level, and at, at some point you realize, well, it's still bacon, yeah, so it's okay. Um, and I'll still eat it, but there's something about the texture, the the thickness of it um and just the the feeling uh the way that it crumbles in your mouth that the the thick cut straight from the butcher that's pretty fresh um versus anything that's packaged and sitting in some kind of brine or whatever they put in there um it's it's a it's a it's an eye opener for people they realize oh i should be getting all my meat at butchers like right you probably should it's going to be way way healthier for you a lot cheaper for you and uh supporting a good you know local uh business so i would still i still love taking people to my butcher to sh to show them that you know this is how this is this is what real meat looks like this is what the color of, of chicken is you know it's not yellow from the chemicals it's actually white you know it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh it's an eye-opening thing um and after that i mean uh, mm, maybe a uh it was like a blue moon a pale ale blue moon pale go with ale. that yeah 
that's the one they always throw the orange in. I never understood why. I was like, oh, thanks. Um, but the, but now when I drink it at home, I'm like, do we have any oranges? <laughs> <laughs> So I I I think that's I think that's what I would do anyway. Oh, well, my it does taste. It, I would just say, in terms of the taste, it's just more volume to it. But it uh, yeah, it, it tends to be like a deeper flavor, like uh, closer to yeah. red meat. And if you can get um, Iberico, which is now a tame pork, but uh, it's in Spain, then it's Iberico, Iberian. I'm a, I'm familiar with the brand actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but well. Here, here's just yeah. I better call it's all the porks down there basically, but they are yeah. much redder because they come from they're closer to the original wild pigs, and the meat being much redder, um, they can they do things that you would normally use beef for um, because it has that much deeper flavor. Oh, okay, okay. Really Very interesting. Yeah, well, no, maybe, maybe I got to go because I live right across from a a, um, a big wild open like a preserve. And they're not supposed to go hunt out there, but they do, and we hear them. <laughs> and uh, maybe I should like, like you know, well, look, I'm not going to call you in if you leave, you know, a few sides here. <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> don't don't go hunting on your own; it won't end well. The damn things are nasty. Yeah, that that's right. We actually, we yeah, we um we have uh, pit bulls, and we've rehomed some of our pit bulls to people who just want to go hogging with them. They they they, they call them a trap dog, and they send them out. And they, uh, um, uh, I guess, bring them back. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they eat them out there. I really don't know what they expect them to do. But um, our dogs aren't really, they're, they're not really suited for that kind of thing. But they always ask us, like, you ever sell a dog? You, ever, you have trap dogs there? I'm like, I don't know what a trap dog is. They like trap beats? I'm like, no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, they hunt with them. Yeah. They, they <laughs> I understand hunting with dogs, and I know that a lot of bred for it. Um, it's just not the image. I'm yeah, I, I mean, I've I've worked with, I've worked around, and I've even taken care of dogs that were trained for hunting, like uh, duck hunting, right. etc. That can do fetch, that can do all the commands. It is beautiful when you see a dog properly trained for it. When it yeah. it knows, it stops, it looks at you. What do I do now? And you you signal it, or you know, just hunker down. The dog comes back because it knows what that means. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. But at the same time, that's that's cool. The same thing with like the sheep herding. It's it's, yeah. it's an amazing kind of thing to see these trained things. But I see my dogs chasing after like you know each other or cats or a bird or something like that, and that's just a mess. That's not something I want to encourage. <laughs> yeah, but as a matter of fact, that's something I usually scream at them. So no, I don't want them to go out in the field. They're just going to go <laughs> scrambling around looking for some brown thing that could probably kill them. That, you know, right. if they if they were if they were cornered or something, you know. So no, I'm not terribly interested in doing that to myself. But, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, that is a <laughs> very <laughs> weird topic to end this one on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to leave my yeah, I like to leave it with a confusing thought. It if makes you want to yeah, you know, If anybody tuned in to hear about power ranges, and now we're talking about using dogs for hunts, yeah, that went weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that's the thing. We're not. We're not just. Uh, we're not just uh, a one-sided people. We got a lot of. Um, yeah. Everything makes us up into individuals. That makes us the flavor that we are, and it's all different. But it's fun finding the things that we share a lot. We seem like different people. Mm -hmm. Us entirely. I don't know how much uh, overlap of stuff, but there are some things that. Oh, there's some things that we overlap that we share. And then when we when we're like okay cool cool we like this and then we start talking about other stuff we find out we actually share a lot more so yeah we got to dig into that worked better yeah that, I think that's a better ending than than talking about pig hunting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to dig into shared experience techniques. of the earth <laughs> anyways cool. just like last time I think last time we cut you off yeah just after an, an hour we went yeah unfortunately need to cut this time we've gone a little bit longer yeah so sorry right? about that. Um, but Tony, just like last time, it was awesome talking to you. Um, yeah, we could probably have gone. Great, on great, no, was great more. catch up with you guys. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I know you have more projects, you have more things you're working on, so we're definitely looking forward to hearing about that. But yeah, you, more stuff in that world and other things as well. Yeah, Power Rangers. You can tell the team it looks awesome. It, I'm sorry to say this, it looks 
better than any time I've seen it on TV. Is that? <laughs> that's that totally fine. And that's 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 absolutely yeah, fine. Yeah, but at the same time, it looks Power Rangery. I'm not an expert. I just watch it right. to keep an eye on my kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's that's a perfect thing for it. It's got a great campy tone. That's part of its charm. Um, yeah. If you can make that connection, then that's 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 uh, that's a good start. Uh, best of luck with the next seasons. I hope there will be many of them. Yeah, I, I, I love I love doing it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And for the folks at yep. home, we'll make sure there are links in the description uh, for all of the stuff uh, Power Rangers and uh, Tony related. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, adios. Thank Ciao. you so much. Well, hello. My name is Tony. I'm the audio engineer of Power Rangers. And you've been listening to the Rated R Bombcast. No, it's a Rated R podcast of Bombsters. What the hell's a Bombcast anyway? <laughs> Proof's in the pudding. <laughs>